Well, thank you everyone for joining our uh, monthly webinar series called Tree Talks. Uh, we've been bringing in different speakers every month to talk about anything and everything related to trees. Uh, this program is sponsored by Georgia Power, so thank you to them for helping us put this monthly webinar series on. Uh, a couple quick housekeeping things. Uh, if you're joining, please keep your microphone muted for the duration. Uh, we just try to limit noise, background noise, it really helps. Uh, but we will have time for questions at the end, so don't worry, you'll have a chance to ask any and all questions that you might have. Um, and we are recording this webinar, so if you know someone that wanted to watch but wasn't able to make it, uh, feel free to pass this along and uh, share this webinar. Uh, that will be up on our YouTube channel uh, within the next day or so. Uh, so for our January Tree Talks, we are talking about native alternatives to invasive trees, and we have Eamon Leonard with the Georgia DNR speaking to us today. Um, and just a quick little background for those of you who might not know who we are. Uh, we're the Savannah Tree Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization that has been around since 1982. Uh, and our mission is to protect and grow Chatham County's urban forest through tree planting, community engagement, and advocacy. And this webinar series kind of does a little bit of the last two points. You know, we help engage with the community. We advocate for trees, native trees, tree protections. Uh, and this is a really great way for us to engage, especially this year when it's been a little bit more difficult to engage in person. Uh, now about our speaker today, Eamon Leonard works with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. Uh, he is born and raised in Huntsville, Alabama, earned a bachelor's in horticulture from Auburn University. I worked at the J.W. Jones Ecological Research Center at Ishaway, then for the USGS in Idaho before attending graduate school at Utah State University. And he obtained a master's in plant ecology there in 2007 uh, with a focus on invasive species. So he's the right person to talk to us today. Uh, Eamon currently works with the Georgia DNR and completed a habitat mapping project that covered 11 coastal counties of Georgia. Uh, he's now working on projects focused on assessment and management of invasive species on state lands, in coastal Georgia and promotes the use of native species. He also sits on the Conservation Task Force for Cannons Point on St. Simons Island. He's chairman of Coastal Wildscapes, chairman of the Coastal Georgia Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, vice chair of the Savannah Pest Risk Committee, treasurer for the Georgia Exotic Pest Plant Council, and treasurer for the Coastal Plain Chapter of the Georgia Native Plant Society. So lots of involvement dealing with invasive species. That's fantastic. I really think, you know, we got the right person for the job today. Uh, and he currently resides in downtown Brunswick and enjoys being out in nature as much as possible, be it hiking, camping, kayaking, or gardening. So thank you so much, Eamon, for being our speaker today. Uh, I'm going to switch it over to you and let you take it away. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. All right. Okay, I think I've got that now. All right, well, thank you all for having me. Um, so I'm going to try to cover at least some of the more common invasive trees. There might be some other trees you might have questions about, some suggestions for native alternatives. I'm happy to kind of uh, maybe brainstorm about that towards the end. Um, and part of this is it's just a vehicle for me to talk about using native trees. Um, and so a lot of these might be great alternatives for all the species I'm talking about. Um, so without further ado, we'll just jump into it. <clears throat> so the first tree you, you hopefully know about, um, Chinese tallow. And um, when I'm talking about alternatives, I'm trying to think about what it is about this um, invasive species that people like. Um, or are looking for. So with Chinese tallow, I'm assuming it's the fall color, maybe the leaf shape or um, the flower type or the, the berry production. So um, I'm gonna look for some natives that, that hit that. So fall color, um, good for bees. One of the kind of no brainers alternatives for um, this species is um, red maple. Um, this is one of our native trees that you're probably aware of that grows in more wetter soils but can do well in a, a normal garden landscape. Um, it's one of the first things to flower in the spring. You could even cut a branch and bring it in and kind of force it to flower. Um, it's attractive to hummingbirds. Another one that um, most people probably don't know much about is black tupelo. 
Um, it's also called um, uh, uh, swamp black gum um, or just black gum. There's a, the more aquatic version is Nissa bipolar. That's uh, swamp black gum. Um, this is a great honey tree. Um, bee um, and honey uh, producers are, are um, covet this tree. Um, it's a nice shade tree. It's deciduous, has great fall color. You can see the pictures of that um, really red um, foliage in the fall. It also produces berries, which are attractive to birds. Um, so there's also the Florida sugar maple, um, which we, it's too hot and humid down here to really have success with the standard sugar maple. Um, but the Florida sugar maple is a much smaller tree. It's, it's a good tree for a smaller landscape. There's a few in downtown Brunswick here that um, have a nice shape on them and they don't take up a ton of room. Um, and it doesn't have the red fall color you would get with Chinese tallow, but it does have a nice um, yellow with maybe some bits of red in it. Um, but it's, it's a great small tree to try. I don't see a ton of this obviously naturally growing on the coast. I have seen some west of Savannah in some sort of protected ravines. Um, so it is close by. Um, and then there's persimmon, which might not be something people think of as um, a landscape tree, but um, it produces fruit that are great for wildlife. Um, the top picture um, is one that I took this past fall um, in a sandhill area. So it can grow in a wide range of habitats from sandhills to wet soils. Um, and has, I think, really, really good fall color. Um, okay, so the next um, tree that a lot of people in the South um, like is mimosa. Um, has a really um, striking flower display in the spring. So I'm gonna talk about some native species that, that have um, spring flowers and that are kind of a small tree. Hopefully this is one you all know about, red buckeye. You can find this one in many different habitats on the coast from uh, shell middens to maritime forests. Um, it can take pretty dry soils. Um, this is one you might be able to find in the landscape trade. Um, it's really easy to grow from um, the fruit you might fall, find on the ground. You wanna plant those immediately and you can get a tree to sprout pretty quickly. Um, but it's kind of a small tree. It has these tubular red flowers. Uh, they're attractive to hummingbirds. The next one um, is another one that's pretty um, common in, um, in the horticulture trade. Um, this is the fringe tree. Um, really uh, showy uh, pendulous clusters of these sort of um, fringe-like tassel flowers. Um, really interesting display. Um, I think it's a lot more attractive than, than the mimosa. Um, puts on a lot more flowers. Um, Deciduous, after the flowers are done, it does um, put on berries which are attractive to birds. Another one that you probably know about, great spring flowering tree, the Eastern red bud. Um, one, of the, one of the earlier things to, to bloom, um, attractive to birds and bees. A plant that I am recommending a lot is even a substitute for dogwood, since dogwoods don't tend to do that well in, um, this part of the country is the two-wing silver bell. Um, so this one you can find, I found native um, along the Altamaha River. Um, there are various cultivars that have sort of maximized flowering, um, but it's, um, as you can see, it has these pendulous um, bell-shaped flowers in the spring. It's kind of a small tree, maybe up to 20 feet. So Bradford pear uh, is one that we are all should be aware of, that we should be getting rid of. That's, um, wasn't invasive for years, and as the story goes, um, nature found a way to produce viable seed and created a version of the, of the calorie pear, the Bradford pear, that now has thorns and is invading old fields and is kind of a nasty plant. Um, so I, one of the plants I um, think people should start looking for is some of the native hawthorns. Um, so the first one that I'm mentioning here is mayhaw. Um, this is the one that they use to produce mayha jelly. It's a very traditional Southern kind of old fashioned plant. Um, but there's different types of um, hawthorns that I think would have some good use as um, a spring small flowering tree. 
Uh, black tie tie is, is a evergreen shrub that grows wild, um, kind of on edges of wetlands. I've not really ever seen it used in the landscape context. Um, I think there are some cultivars now of this, some that have pink flowers. Um, so this is one that I think is worth trying. Um, it has a huge display of flowers in the spring. Um, you can even see it from the air if they're all flowering. It's that, it's that kind of packed full. So this next one, Snowbell, um, it's not really a tree. It's more of a large shrub. Um, so if you've got a smaller space, um, this is a great one. This one I've seen growing in a lot of different habitats from um, edges of wetlands to sandhills. I think most of the literature says it needs more of like a moist soil, but I've seen it growing in pretty sandy areas. Um, another um, spring flowering that has kind of these bell-shaped flowers, but the, the ends of the flowers kind of curve back. Um, then it produces these berry clusters in the fall that I think are kind of attractive. Again, the silver bell, I always, I keep um, promoting that one. It does have a little bit of fall color. Um, so it kind of gives you another uh, season of interest. Okay, a uh, china berry. Um, this is one that was introduced a long time ago. It has um, these clusters of um, showy flowers in the spring. Um, big berry clusters that persist through the winter and these really large compound leaves. Um, so when I'm looking at maybe some alternatives to this, if maybe people like that large compound leaf, very showy flowers or seeds that are somewhat similar. Um, the first one is devil's walking stick. This might not be the most accessible for everyone. Um, as you can see from the name and the picture on the right, um, it has quite a formidable um, set of thorns that um, guard the stem. So this may be the back of a property or maybe a more natural landscape, but it has a huge display of flowers that are a pollinator magnet. And following that, you have um, these very nice um, sort of fleshy berries that are uh, very attractive to birds. Um, so if this is something you can have in your landscape, it's a great um, a pollinator and bird plant. A similar plant that's maybe not accessible to everyone is Hercules Club, I but I think that bark is really striking. Um, it would keep your neighborhood kids from maybe climbing it. Um, but this is a, a plant you see on edges of um, causeways, maybe the causeway to Jekyll or Tybee, um, grows on edges of marshes, hammocks, um, in maritime forests. It's a very tough tree. Um, it's also called toothache tree, so you might have had someone, had someone have you chew on it. It sort of numbs your mouth a little bit. Um, but the flowers are attractive to bees and butterflies. Um, and then you've got the berries after that. A similar plant that grows in a similar habitat to the Hercules Club, this one you can also see in the dunes on the barrier, barrier islands is wing sumac. Mm -hmm. um, this does have a little bit of fall color as well, but you have these um, clusters of uh, creamy white flowers in the spring, followed by um, these clusters of berries. And the berries you can actually use to make um, like a lemonade drink if you gather them when they're fresh, but you can also make a spice out of them that has sort of a citrus taste to it. So beyond just the small tree kind of compound leaf look, you can there's other uses for this plant. Um, soapberry is another uh, tree that has compound leaves. It has berries very similar to the china berry. Um, the berries are actually used um, in um, kind of um, for laundering clothes because it has saponin in them, which um, attracts dirt from fabrics, um, which can be a little dangerous because you don't want to get it on your eyes or anything. But this is a plant that's very um, tied into shell in the soil. So um, shell middens, you'll often find this in the, on the coast. So Jekyll Island, there's a, a shell midden on the causeway. There's, this tree is present there. And then in Florida, uh, Timucuan or Timucuan, however you say it, they have a lot of these trees growing naturally there. Um, it's one, uh, kind of an interesting uh, native tree. Princess tree, I don't see a ton of this on the coast. It, it's a huge problem when you get up into the Piedmont as far as being invasive, but it's um, often billed as a really quick growing shade tree, has very showy flowers, and then followed by these um, seed capsules. So um, the alternatives I'm giving you, they might have a showy flower or, uh, or a large shade tree alternative. Uh, so again, I keep giving you this um, red buckeye. I can't 
uh, promoted enough, um, really showy flowers. Again, I've talked about it already about hummingbirds being attracted to it. Um, and then that's the, um, the fruit cluster or the, um, the nuts that are created. Catalpa, um, <clears throat> very close relative obviously of the princess tree, similar leaves, very similar looking flowers. Um, this one's really more native to Southwest Georgia, but I have seen it planted on the coast. I wouldn't put it anywhere where you get salt spray, probably wouldn't be able to tolerate that. But if you're looking for something with a really uh, showy flower display, kind of like the um, princess tree, this would, this would do it for you. Um, another uh, great shade tree that does grow on the coast, though away from the maritime influence, more on sort of wet slopes is the tulip tree. Um, attracts hummingbirds as a, as a great sh shade tree. Another um, great shade tree is the um, overcup oak. Obviously you're not getting the huge flowers like a princess tree, but you're getting that, su that similar size and kind of creating a, a nice shade tree. This one we find naturally growing on the Altamaha River in a community with um, water, um, water hickories. Um, so naturally it grows kind of in floodplain forests, but um, will also grow in the normal um, garden situation. A camphor tree, um, if you don't know this tree, it's, it's found a lot on the coast. I see it in old parts of town on disturbed areas on barrier islands. Um, it's a, a glossy evergreen tree. The um, leaves are um, fragrant. If you crush them, crush them, it has sort of that camphor kind of Vicks smell to it. Um, so things that I'm giving you as an alternative are things that are large evergreen trees that are berries, that have berries and are, are kind of more tough trees. Um, so the first obvious one is our Southern Magnolia. Um, there's a lot of different cultivars of this, so you can maybe um, focus on what would fit in your landscape. I'm looking at these different cultivars. Again, I'm mentioning overcup oak as a, a large shade tree. Um, something that's much smaller but is evergreen is devilwood osmanthus. This is actually closely related to the tea olive that's a popular uh, non-native landscape plant on the coast. Um, this one grows in a wide range of habitats on the coast, um, more dry forests, you find it in the maritime forest um, on sand hills. Um, but it's a smaller tree, uh, you can, or you can train it to a bush, but it has kind of a um, multi-stemmed look to it, um, and then has these dark berries. Um, another kind of obvious one is the American holly. Uh, if you're looking for something that's evergreen, a good um, barrier or um, kind of a hedge kind of look. The American holly has various cultivars that might fit your different needs. Um, they're also great for giving birds cover in the landscape, giving them something that they can dart into to avoid predators. Um, so I'm going to dip into a couple um, shrubs um, and maybe a couple of vines just to be fun. Um, so we've got a lot of different privets, um, the Chinese privet, the glossy privet, and the Japanese privet. Um, so again, I'm giving the devil wood osmanthus as an alternative to this that you can maybe use it as um, a hedging material. Um, Yopon holly um, is a great native um, holly. Um, there are different cultivars. Um, there's some that are dwarf. This picture on the top right is at Altama Plantation, which is a state property we acquired in 2015, um, exit 42 in, in Glynn County. Um, and it, actually a part of this um, uh, formal garden that we've been restoring since about 2016. And we've planted a lot of these native trees that I'm talking about um, as a location to go to kind of look at them as examples. And so, and I'm also growing them to kind of see how they do as well. Um, and maybe if they really are tanking, I'll stop um, uh, suggesting them as alternatives. Um, so Yopon Hollies has a lot of uh, flexibility. Horse sugar um, is not one that many people use and I'm kind of curious to get input or in, info back from others who have used it as a landscape tree. It's very common on the coast, um, grows in a wide range of habitats, mostly drier areas. Um, it's evergreen unless we get a really hard um, frost. Um, it has interesting flowers that I see a lot of pollinators on in the spring. Um, and then the, the leaf itself is, um, has kind of a sweet uh, taste to it. Um, that's why it's called horse sugar. Um, but I think it could be used as a small tree or um, hedged and to, to be kept in size. Um, one that's really common that's 
really not native to Georgia. It's more of a Florida native. It's the yellow anise. Um, you can find it a lot in nurseries. Um, it's a great alternative to a lot of the privets to create um, a dense hedge. Um, and I'm going to put a few vines because a lot of these can have inputs, impacts to native trees. So um, things that maybe the alternatives to some of these more commonly used um, or found exotic invasive vines, uh, using these natives as things that would have less of an impact to our native trees. Um, so coral honeysuckle is a great um, alternative. I think it's a lot more attractive than the exotic as these tubular flowers uh, that are attracted to hummingbirds. Um, Carolina jessamine, very commonly used in the South, great evergreen um, flowering vine, early spring flowers. Um, butterfly pea is not one you're probably going to see um, sold in many places, but you'll see it um, in maritime forest edges, um, in um, pine, upland pine communities on the edges of those. Um, it's more of a late summer flower. Um, climbing aster is available in some of the um, native plant nurseries. It's not really climbing, it's just a large um, sort of uh, Aster that has these long stems that kind of hook onto things. Um, but this one we find growing naturally on wetland edges. If you've ever been to Kay Creek at exit 76, right near the um, canopy tower, there's a great uh, area that has is full of this plant. Um, great fall flowers are quite large, um, somewhat fragrant, attractive to um, pollinators. Wisteria can be incredibly uh, detrimental to trees. Um, so we have a lot of people who really like them, so it's good to give them alternatives that um, would be a lot, lot less damaging. So there's a native wisteria that we find growing along um, the Altamar River, um, slopes up from wetlands. Um, there's various cultivars of this as well, so you can find it in the nursery if you're looking. The next one is Virgin's Bower. Um, there's a couple invasive clematises, so this is a good alternative to those as well. You might be able to find this in some of the native um, nurseries as well. So passion vine, this is one I would definitely um, uh, suggest with caution. It's definitely very aggressive. Um, it might be a good place to plant it is in a pot that you can keep track of it or an area that you can mow around or somewhere where you're okay with it sort of taking over. Um, so of the native vines, this one is definitely a little bit aggressive, but it's a great pollinator plant, a host plant for butterflies. Um, hemp vine is one that's not commonly found in the nursery trade, but it's very commonly found in the wild on the coast. You'll find it on shrubs that are growing on edges of wetlands. Um, kind of has a hemp type look um, with the leaves. Um, the flowers are very attractive to pollinators. Um, you'll find it blooming kind of in mid to late summer. Um, it's pretty easy to grow from seed. The last vine I'm going to talk about that has damage to trees is obviously English ivy. Um, so some great alternatives, things that are evergreen that aren't going to kind of take over and climb up trees. Um, partridge pea, I have seen this available in um, some native plant nurseries. It's mo mostly found and does better in moist sites, but creates kind of a nice evergreen ground cover. Um, powder puff is a um, uh, also called uh, sensitive briar. This is a, a variety that doesn't have thorns, but in nature it's found in very dry sites. Um, it's a very tough plant. It, I would probably plant this somewhere where you're okay with it kind of uh, taking over the ground cover area. Um, it can grow in full sun, part sun, has these very interesting kind of Dr. Seuss-like puffs of flowers. Um, milk pea is an evergreen vine that uh, we do see in the, in the maritime forest quite a bit. Um, I think it has great potential for being used as a ground cover. It does have flowers. They're little white pea-like flowers, but they're somewhat sporadic. Um, I think it's more just the texture of the leaves and the evergreen quality of it that um, gives it some landscape value. And again, the Carolina jessamine I've talked about before um, is, is evergreen and a great alternative to um, instead of English ivy. Um, so um, kind of wrapping it up here, there's a, there's a lot of resources for native plants. Um, a couple of the more local ones, um, Thompson's Garden, which is out uh, I-16, uh, Floribundance Gardens in Darien, um, Nature's Case, which is in Beaufort, and then far away, but um, one that we've used for is Lazy K in Pine Mountain. 
And then there's some mail, mail order sources, a couple of seed companies. And then the last one is a, an outfit out of Lee, Florida. There's also a great list um, that the State Botanic Garden in Athens has put together. So if you just Google um, native plant sources, Georgia, they have a suggested list of uh, reputable native plant um, nurseries within Georgia that they kind of want you to focus on because we know that they're um, not selling invasive species, they're um, not wild collecting, they're doing things responsibly like that. Um, and I also work with a, a local nonprofit called Coastal Wildscapes. And um, before everything happened with COVID, we would have these spring and fall plant sales in Darien. We've kind of switched those to virtual and just kind of work with some of the native plant nurseries to compile a list of what's available and just kind of help facilitate communication and um, the customer and the business can figure out how to um, acquire the plants on their own. So hopefully eventually we'll start having in-person fall plant sales um, in Darien at the Ashton Tilly Center. Um, we've also, we did a native tree giveaway this past fall at Altama. And I hope to do that in the future. I wanna start collecting more native tree seeds, um, kind of trying to grow some of these trees um, from local gene sources, um, some of the ones that I'm suggesting. Um, so yeah. So with that, um, hopefully I covered some things that were interesting. Um, and I'm definitely open to questions or suggestions if you've had luck or not had luck growing some of these um, these species, I'd be interested in your thoughts. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Eamon. Um, yeah. We will leave the, the chat box open for a couple minutes, or if it's easy for people to just unmute, feel free to do that as well. Um, but yeah, we'll leave it open for questions for just a minute. Uh, Claudia says, yes, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I was really happy to see the um, Devil's Walking Stick. I think that's one of my <laughs> favorite natives. It is so cool, um, you know, a little aggressive looking, but I think a, a fascinating species. And um, thank you for providing some of those resources for where to actually acquire them, because that's one of the biggest challenges that we find is, you know, people ask us, well, yes, I want to get a Tupelo, but where can I buy one? You know, most retail nurseries don't carry them. Um, right. So that's, that's a challenge. So thank you for sharing that list and we'll make sure that um, that's available to folks. Yeah, I bought three black Tupelos, but I had to get them from that mail order place in Florida. So it's, that's the right. hardest one I've been able to find to get a local, local source. It is. And, you know, we um, just started last year of doing a, a native tree sale and we're going to do this every year of just taking pre-orders of a certain amount of species. And if you want to buy one, we'll have them available. Um, and we try to focus on native. So we had Tupelos last year, we had fringe trees, um, Eastern red buds, uh, loblolly bays, just, you know, really trying to get those native species out there that are hard to find, you know? Right. Um, and I know Coastal Wildscapes does their tree sales, which are also fantastic. I love going to those or plant sales, you know, more That's than it. just the, the trees. Yeah, lots of good, good natives. Yep. Oh yes, and Zoe mentioned, we do still have some fringe trees if anybody is interested in one, because now is planting season for trees. Got to get them in the ground before in the next couple of months. Um, have right. you had many people planting silver bells, the Helesia in Savannah? You know, I haven't. Um, I've been trying to find them and get a good location for to plant some of those. Um, I did speak to Gosh, there was uh, some landscape architect who actually recommended them. Um, and I can't remember who it was, but there are people out there interested in them because they fill that niche of the sort of small ornamental tree, like you're saying, like the dogwoods, which just do not perform well here. Um, people really want dogwoods. They ask us all the time when we do giveaways, say, oh, you're going to have dogwoods. Yes. Said, no, no, I'm sorry. Or no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't in good conscience give you a dogwood. Um, so we, we are looking at a lot of options like that, um, you know, especially to re replace crepe myrtles. I, I understand right. they're tough trees, they're, they have a lot of value, but we got to utilize those natives more. So Right. Yeah, we, I think we planted about 60 something native trees at Altama in sort of like this native tree grove with labels and everything. So oh, um, wonderful. Really hoping people kind of come by their seeds only to kind of see what's blooming in the spring, what's giving fall color and 
they're still establishing, so they're small, so they haven't really sure. gotten to their their um, final size. But I've got a, a sugar maple there that's doing really well, and oh, good. it's got a little bit of red color to it. So I was kind of hopeful that it would it would give us some fall color. That's kind of a hard thing to get in the south, since it's so tied to moisture and other factors. It is, yeah. Um, as much as people hate sweet gums. Yeah, they, they have good fall color. They have deep purple, you know, all the way to yellows, yeah. reds. <laughs> you yeah. just have to deal with the gumballs. Right. Um, great. All right. Well, I, I don't see any other questions, um, but if folks have questions, feel free to reach out to either us or I think Eamon's uh, info is up there at the end. Um, so if you're watching the recording, go ahead and pause and shoot us an email. Um, but thank you again, Eamon, so much. This was fantastic. And um, hopefully people will be planting more natives. Awesome. Thank you. Happy All to be right. here. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.